The Tyler Tolman video that I just uploaded is one version of a sales promotion that he did uh, around about March 2019. There's another video that he did uh, using an amended um, PowerPoint that um, was done around, well, by August 2019. And they're essentially the same but it's it's kind of like looking at two pictures and spotting the difference like the difference in the first video is that Tyler Tolman didn't introduce all the people the project managers and those heavily involved in it until the end whereas in his second version he introduces them in the beginning makes them far more prominent and important as the spearhead of the project and the other not noticeable difference is one second his um, mentioning of Gillian Norman and the case against her and basically that this project that he's involved with has got nothing to do with what she was involved with well beg to differ with you Tyler because uh, on the uh, Voxes it's very clear that what you're involved with at Nightcap was always part of Bulla Bulla but some of the people in Bulla Bulla actually wanted to know what was going on where the money was being spent so they kicked them out and planned to buy back the community the land after they put it into liquidation to phoenix it which is an illegal mover to actually do that to get rid of any debts and any of your problem people that were asking too many valid honest questions so yes she was involved with the project you're involved with because the project you're involved with was started off by adrian brannock and mark darwin at Bulla Bulla. So yes, she is a part of what you are now involved with, Tyler Tolman. Now the other interesting thing too is that in, uh, what was it, April 2020, Mark McMurtry does a promotional thing about Nightcap on Minjimbul with Max Egan and he also talks about 28 kilometres of road that will be sealed. Even here, Tyler Tolman tells us there's 120 kilometres of dirt roads, 27 kilometres of main roads, which will be sealed. They will be have bitumen on them. But no, now we've got 26 and a half kilometres of unsealed roads. Unsealed roads that are going up and down into mountainous regions that are already difficult at certain times of the year to pass. There are sections in the Voxes that Mark Darwin talks about, well he's not even going to try getting back in to Bulla Bulla because the roads are impassable. It's too dangerous. And that's the thing with a high level of traffic going over all these unsealed roads. Imagine 392 houses, thousands of cars each day, come to this time of the year when everything's flooding how many of those people are actually going to be able to make it up the hill into their home oh but they might be able to make it up to the hill to get to that little bitumen strip to get to the rest of the way up or maybe they won't but with their unsealed roads every year they're going to have to be regrading the unsealed roads. We know they will wash out in the seasonal downpours and flooding. So there will be components of that 26 and a half kilometres of unsealed road that are constantly going to have to be regraded every year. So in omitting now, there's no bitumen, no sealed roads. All these promises that were made by Tyler Tolman Max Egan and Mark McMurtry and Adrian Brannock having sealed roads. Now we're back to ungraveled 
I mean, unsealed, gravel, dangerous roads. And that is unacceptable. There are going to be a high level of accidents. There was an accident with a car just trying to get up the hill. It backslid, couldn't get, hot, get any traction in the heavy rain and the, the muddy, gravelly roads and smashes the car. And that's not an accident that happens because an animal has just jumped out in front of you, which is going to happen all the time, especially if you're traveling on these roads at dusk, dawn, or during the night, you're gonna to have to be extremely careful. So if you're trying to boot it up the hill so that you, know, you won't get stuck halfway up, you could very well find that you're doing speeds enough that, well, now an animal just jumps out in front. There are too many dangers on their unsealed roads. They promised, they promoted over and over again, sealed roads. And then as soon as the development application is lodged, they're unsealed roads. And instead of being a million for every kilometre of sealed road, they're now <laughs> bugger all for unsealed roads. Dangerous, extremely dangerous unsealed roads. I don't know of any subdivision development that has got unsealed roads. If you would like to point out anywhere in Australia where there's a subdivision with unsealed roads, with thousands of cars going over it every day, I'd like to see that because it's not safe and as far as I'm concerned, it wouldn't be legal, shouldn't be legal. Now he goes on further to talk about heal thyself clusters. And he does in the second one talk about, oh, he doesn't want to smell your barbecues. So he wants to live in a cluster, a group of incels, where they all have the same values. And essentially, in what he's defining, is that each and every single one of those roads would be its own little um, click. And in the sense of, well, if you saying that you don't want to mix in with the larger community, you're intending to actually create lots of different mindset clusters. Tyler Tolman wants one for vegans. And he also made a point about, you know, there's not going to be a slaughterhouse on the land, blah, blah, blah. Oh, as if there would have been. Do you know how highly regulated and how much money it would take to run an abattoir? And besides that, you know, um, you can't graze cattle on there because it's not grazing land. That little bit out the front was and that little bit attached to 3222 at the back, maybe. But when Peter Van Leishout got development approval for DA-06-1054, the common stipulations that was part of that approval was no hoofed animals, no cats or dogs. And yet they're saying that you can have pets there if they at the community approve it. Well, that's not actually the case. There are and there would be, given with standard approval, no hoofed animals allowed on the land. So they wouldn't be allowed to have their horses and they wouldn't be allowed to have the cat or the dog. And there were a lot of dogs at Bulla Bulla. In fact, you can hear it in the Voxes where Mark Darwin's making up all these dramas about, oh, yeah. You know, you know, when I used to play with my dog, her teeth used to knock on my fingers and sometimes I'd get this little lump that would swell up. She never meant to hurt me or bite me. It's just like, yeah, sometimes when you play, you get a little bit rough. And even though animals do try, I've seen so many dogs that are gentle, so gentle, but yet they can, you know, even in that gentleness, knock your body about or kids bodies about and 
you might get a little lump or a bruise. I mean, Mark Darwin made out that he couldn't write for days and he couldn't do all of this, you know, as if some dog savaged him. I mean, seriously, but just him talking about that, the pettiness and what he actually brought out about that and how, oh, you know, I'm going to make a big deal out of it is just another example of why so many of these um, communities that do attempt to set up have difficulties because of all the conflict and differences between people. But in this community, they don't intend to create one community. They intend to create 10, 10 little clusters of people, incels of their own mindset that would not necessarily get along with other people in the community so they don't live near them. But one thing you should notice there where it says stricter bylaws for our community, there is the expectation of the laws in Australia that you follow them. Then there is the whole set of laws that would be imposed on you by the mindset of the developers of Nightcap on Minjimbal in their capacity as the dictator of the project. As I have said, well, Mark Darwin and Adrian Brennock have clearly pointed out that Bulla Bulla was a democracy and they're not going to make the same mistakes with setting up Nightcap. And ultimately, even when you look at this, that says a formal title certificate relating to your RDS after and upon in issuance of the form formal and final DA. So in other words, if you've paid money in, you will not have any legal proof of title over the land until the last stage of the development application, the final part where all everything is done and all it is is a matter of filling up those 392 slots. So not until that's all over will you get any legal title over it. Now, when is that expected to happen? Well, in 2019, Tyler Tolman is actually stating that the development application is 100% compliant, which is a lie. And then he further adds that it's been lodged. He says that the development application has been lodged. Now we've heard this for several years that this mythical application a DA had been lodged, but nobody could find it. Now, if this mythical development application did actually exist prior to January, why does DA 21-0010 exist? If all these existing DA applications that have been lodged, yes, lodged, there's a big difference to being trying to lodge it and somebody says, no, that doesn't fit, go back and fix it. They have claimed not only Tyler Tolman has said it's been lodged and that it's 100% compliant, so it's virtually, it's guaranteed. There's no way that it cannot be approved. But in the Nightcap on Minjimbal official documentary, both Adrian Brannock and Richard Moat state that there is existing approval. And yet, again, if this mythical approval existed that couldn't be found by anybody existed then why would they need to put in DA 21-0010 in putting in develop this development application in January they have confirmed that all their assertions made prior to that when there was pre-existing approval, when there was a development application already lodged. All of these things were false. So of the options that Tyler Tolman revealed in 2019, there's three options. 
and I've come to uh, discover that there are now further options. You can also invest in Nightcap on Minjimbal through precious metals and cryptocurrencies. They will take anything you've got. If you've got something to hand over that's worth some kind of capital you know, gain for them, it can be exchanged for good services or products, yeah, they will take it. As long as you've got the right mindset though. Now here's the thing, in setting up these clusters, let's say for example that Tyler Tolman picks his street to live on and he can only have a say over which piece of land he picks. And the next person that comes along, because as you come in, you are picking your lot out of all those 392, you get that preference. So someone likes the lot next door to Tyler Tolman's, but they're not even a vegetarian and they love their barbecues. What's he going to do to stop it? He can't stop it because he's got no control over who his neighbours are and he also cannot interfere with their choice in the selection of the block. So how do they propose to set up these in cell communities, each with their little cliques and their own mindset, when there is the freedom of choice for the vendor to pick the lot that he wants? Sorry, not the vendor, the purchaser. <laughs> Got that a little bit wrong, didn't I, back to front? But you knew what I meant anyway. Now, one thing that was discovered with the Bulla Bulla technique that's now the Nightcap or Minjimbul technique is that there is a certain number, number of investors that they'll draw in at a certain price. Then when they've achieved that, up will go the price of the buy-in. And gradually, up and up and up goes the buy-in price. As they need to do more things on the land, they will ask people buying in to absorb the higher cost of buying in at that level. And they've got all these tiers of pricing. But currently, currently from December, this is their pricing, 299000 to 399000 And that's prior to any kind of DA approval. And what are the chances of achieving that development application approval? So when you look at NICAP on Minjimbal's development application, when you look at what the possible outcomes can possibly be. Let's just look at the scenario where they are given permission to do stage one works. And this permission, let's say by back and forth, back and forth, it takes at least a year. So this time next year, they could get stage one approval. So now they've got it, okay? Now they need to come up with the money to do it, which Peter Van Leishout, who's actually got more access to money than what these developers have, couldn't afford to actually even start doing the smaller development that he had in mind. 26 and a half kilometers worth of road at $18 million that's going to take a bit of time. Now, across the road here at Mebane Springs development, that's taken 10 years for them to actually get to the stage where they can sell the lots. So let's say that in a best case scenario that for the developer, that they could actually achieve spending $8 million working flat out, say in a couple of years, and have everything done, say within 
the end of three years from now. Then what they need to do is because they'd only have conceptual approval for the rural land sharing communities, they'd then need to lodge a development application to do the real works for the rural land sharing communities. And there's two options that they're going to find now. One of them will contain the existing problems that they have today. One, that it is not a single lot. It is not in line with the schedule, the only schedule and the only clause that allows them to even build a rural land sharing community in the Tweed Shire Council is the State Environmental Planning Policy. And that clearly specifies a single lot. They propose 10. But they propose to get those 10 by subdividing, which further conflicts with subdivision is prohibited under that schedule. So let's just imagine that it's not that scenario, but the one I'm about to say has happened in the, the three years that they've got their approval to do their roadworks, they've spent their 18 million, they've got their ready, now we're going to put in the development application for the rural land sharing communities and the subdivision. They try to put it in the planning portal, it is rejected. And it is rejected because the Tweedshire Council are no longer on the state environmental planning policy and it doesn't apply to them anymore. So you cannot apply to have the rural land sharing community under the state environmental planning provisions. You could only attempt to do it through the local council laws. But the local council laws actually prohibit rural land sharing communities. Are you seeing my problem here? That even if they did get to the end of stage work, uh, stage one, roads are completed, there is no ability to lodge a development application to get approval to go any further with developing the rural land sharing communities. Now I believe that it is going to be the ultimate outcome that within a few years, if not sooner, the Tweed Shire Council will remove themselves from the state environmental planning policy. And it will no longer be applicable that any rural land sharing communities can be done in the Tweed Shire. And this comes from their history with the problems and I dare say that a lot of the problems that actually came out of Bulla Bulla in are probably part of their main evidence against actually having rural land sharing communities. Because there is no clear title of ownership, it creates a lot of issues for people and costly in civil litigation. And as you can see with Gillian Norman that Civil litigation, unless you actually have proper representation, you're going to fail. Those that did have proper representation, though, you might have um, heard in the Voxes how they're talking about Nicole Stanton and how they're going to um, ruin her and go for her um, public indemnity insurance and see what they can screw her over for there. Well... They failed big time there because there were competent legal people representing her, not self-representing and yes, well, anyway. So let's just say that in looking at all the cases that they put effort into, Gillian Normans was the only one that they had success in. Then I looked at that and I asked myself, why did they have success? and it all came down to legal representation and the ability to argue effectively and produce the evidence effectively. The allegations that they made against Nicole Stanton were dismissed. They appealed it and that was dismissed too. 
So for all their huff and bluff and everything about how successful they are, they are not very successful most of the time. This is why they promote Gillian Norman's success, well, their success with her, because it is their only success. And if she'd had proper legal representation, it would have been a different story. I know this because you can't self... <laughs> with these kinds of cases, I wouldn't even self-represent. You know, uh, it's you're just asking for trouble. You're asking for a bad outcome. And it's just like, you know, any lawyer knows too that if you, if you even go in to try and represent represent yourself in court. You've got a fool for a client. There are certain levels where self-representation can work to your advantage, but at the level that Julia Norman found herself at, she needed competent legal uh, staff, to, lawyers, that could communicate with the courts and give them what was required. And for the amount of times that she was given to actually provide the court with what they required, she just didn't get, you know, eight times she submitted the same thing expecting a different result. And sadly, that thing she kept submitting eight times was more hearsay. The judge wanted a list of allegations and evidence that would back those allegations up. That's it. He didn't want to know the ins and outs of all the bitching and the arguing in the community and who was right and who was wrong. He's not there to tell you who's right and wrong in your moral stances. He's there to judge your accusations with the evidence. Instead of hearing this long he said, she said, and they did this, they did that, and it was like, no, 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 you're not getting it. You need to present what have they actually done wrong? You're giving me a story of a version of events. What you need to do is give me specifically what did they do wrong and what is the evidence that you have. Then when the judge has that, he can then have that in front of him and the court can then proceed to go through those allegations with the evidence piece by piece. The judge couldn't even get that, that list in front of him. I mean, in essence, it's like the, the contents of what's going to come. It's not trying to explain the whole case. It is just the contents. I'm going to deal with this accusation, this accusation, this accusation, and I've got this evidence, this evidence, and this evidence. So it is really sad for Gillian Norman that she's found herself in this position. But also, she made those decisions for herself, especially when she dismissed her free po po pro bono barrister because he wouldn't argue the case the way she wanted it to. What you don't understand is that when you go into a court, you need someone that speaks their lingo. Because if you can't speak their lingo, your case is gonna get dismissed. That's what happened to Julia Norman. And not only did it get dismissed, but because of her failure in all of those other respects, then comes the fact that she never proved any of the allegations that she made. And now she's facing all these, um, well, all these judgments, it's, there's only really one, but all these costs. Costs that they spent in the millions just to shut her up because she was actually writing about her experience. Yeah, she might have been um, going fishing for a lot of information, maybe got a lot of information perhaps not quite right, as we all do when we're trying to figure out what is going on when people are hiding the facts. Now in the Voxes, they talk about how the investors at Bulla Bulla were accusing them of secret deals. Yet the investors at Bulla Bulla didn't know anything about Peter Van Leishout's land and what they were doing to try and sell, uh, try and buy that with their money. 
And as they're bringing in other investors because they want to buy Peter Van Leishout's land and expand out more, that was a secret deal. There was an accusation made by many of them that secret deals are going on behind the investor's back with their money. And they deny it. And even in the Voxes, when Mark Darwin says, oh, you know, they were talking about that we were doing secret deals and then I showed them that we weren't. And I was going, see, we're not even doing them. And it's like, how could he lie like that? How could he actually convince himself that what he was doing in secret behind their back wasn't even going on? It's all through the Voxes, how they're trying to set up the PVL contract and all these ones that were buying in, well, now I suppose we can just slot them into the commercial and keep them on, on standby there while we'll get PVL's land and then we'll shove them into there and then we'll buy back uh, the land uh, from Bulla Bulla after we've thrown it into liquidation and got rid of the deadbeats that, um, well, they just don't want to be dictated to. They just want to have what we promised them equal say, transparency, and seriously, I think anyone would like to know, well, what are you doing with our money? And I think any investor has the right to know. There was over $600,000 that nobody could account for. And that was, at that time, they were trying to buy Mount Burrell Commercial and get Peter Van Leishout's land. So where do you reckon that 600000 that should have been the investors' money? And they were asking, well, where is it? And, well, you can see history is now what you can see, that in asking those questions, where is that 600000 they got cut loose and now they're still sitting waiting for even their payback from that. In the meantime, Adrian Brannock and Mark Darwin just kept going. Then they had a falling out because I dare say that after the failure with Nicole Stan, uh, Stort, what? yeah, Nicole, um, I think Mark Darwin must have realised that they keep blowing all this money, wasting all this time just to get somebody and to wind up with nothing. And even in the Voxes now, you can hear him saying that I think your path and my path are two different things. So he's already thinking, you know, that, yeah, I'm getting out. But clearly it got to a stage where he did get out. And that was in 2018. And in 2021, by now, as per the agreement that I've actually seen, is that Mark Darwin should have been paid 150000 and that certain conditions should have been met whereby he is removed from directorships or shareholdings and the same with Caroline Coleman's Loved Ones Tribe. And we know that Loved Ones Tribe, just like Adrian Brennock, you know, you wives, you women, you shut up and we're the men, we do, we do it. You do as you're told. See, Mark Darwin put Stephanie Humble in a bad position because he put everything in her name and she was facing going to jail over the Freedom Summits. I don't think we've got to those voxes yet, but um, the only reason that Mark Darwin actually stopped Stephanie from going to jail, who was then his pregnant ex with his fourth, that... He was concerned about what she would say in court if they charged her and tried to put her in jail. So he protected her to protect himself because if she went to court, he'd be going to jail too. And probably AB. Now they did have other town planners, but those town planners actually said that what you want to achieve cannot be achieved within the laws that exist. And one of those big reasons was water catchment. And the water catchment has been completely ignored by Planet, their current town planner. 
Why? Because Logan City Council and Gold Coast City Council, did you notice I said both cities? Well, planet that are on the Gold Coast took two city councils and wanted to apply their laws to a shire, to a whole shire in a rural area across the border in another state. That's just to avoid the issue of water catchment so that it could come down to, well, we only have to do erosion now. We don't have to worry about water quality because in the Gold Coast City Council and the Logan City Council, you don't have to worry about those things when you build. Well, of course you don't. They're cities. There's no country there. City. Councils, not shire. And if you actually bring it out a little bit and go up to where they want to apply these rules. See, this area here is pretty much the Tweed Shire. And as you can see, a lot of that through there is agricultural. There's not a heavy density of housing. But you go along here to the Gold Coast, the Gold Coast Council. Um, there's a one good reason why they wouldn't worry about stormwater catchment is because there's no development around their stormwater catchment. They wouldn't allow it. Their people in, on the Gold Coast Council are over this side. They, they can't affect the water catchment. So of course there would be no consideration because they don't affect it. So they've taken, planet town planners have taken two city councils in another state that do not affect water catchment and that's why they have no provision in there for it and said it's not necessary and then applied it to this rural region across the border in another state in another well it's Gold Coast City Council it's Logan City Council you go across it's the Bow Desert Shire Council because Shire and City are two different things so Planet are trying to apply city standards in another state to a rural area in New South Wales. It's ridiculous. And I've been told by the developer that he's perfectly comfortable with the standard of quality of their town planner. Well, of course you would be because he's completely ignoring what any other ordinary town planner would be taking into consideration. I mean, how many town planners do you know that would be wanting to set up here in this council, in this state, and then use laws in another state from a city? Not just one city, but two cities. And of course he had to use the Gold Coast City Council and the Logan City Council because they don't affect water catchment. But I guarantee you if he went to the Bow Desert Shire Council, he'd find a completely different story. They would do water testing quality because they can affect the water catchment area. And that's just one incompetence of planet. Well, I can't say it's incompetence. It's deliberate as far as I'm concerned because when they noted that Misty Mountains here in this area is now on this strip of land here, if they were lot numbers that may be on the same DP and they were next to one another and they just, instead of putting in, say, lot 10, they put in lot 11, that you could understand is a mistake. But to have a completely different lot number, a completely different DP number, and to have a development application approval with the actual lot number on it, and to still get it wrong, 
I mean, seriously, how good is your town planner? Well, he's good because he wants to try and ignore water catchment. He wants to ignore single lots. He wants to ignore subdivision prohibition. He wants to ignore building over a wildlife corridor. He wants to ignore all these things and he's happy to do that because we pay him to do that and as long as we pay him to do that, he's happy to ignore them. And that's where integrity or lack of integrity in any business professional must come in. You know, the standard and quality of their work. If I wanted a legitimate job done, I would most definitely not go to Planet. If I was a dodgy dealer who wanted someone that could try and explain away all my breaches and make them sound like they're not breaches, I'd go with Planet because they're willing to look the other way and explain away or ignore or do whatever it takes to give me what I want. As long as I pay for it, they'll do it. Because they don't care if their reputation is tarnished. They don't care whether they're reputable or not. They just care about profits. And it doesn't matter which industry you're looking in. You're going to find there's all the different grades of, yeah, that's a good one. I trust them. They can do the job. They're really good at it. Or here's one over here is that, like, how many times have you been to a tax agent and they've told you that you couldn't do certain things? And then you might have found another one that said, oh yeah, we can get that back for you and claim this and claim that. It's like, hang on, all the other ones said they couldn't do it. How come you can? Well, it's not the fact that a tax agent actually takes the blame. It's you that takes the blame if you make the claims. <laughs> They're not held responsible for any advice they give you. It's you that does the actions. So if you're buying into NICAP on Mingenbull right now, you're looking at 299 to 399,000 to buy in. And it's a little bit of a problem because the 16 lots that make up Zimmerland that they want to buy, they don't actually own. There is no clear uh, outcome on that because this purchase of Peter Van Leishout's land has been going on since 2016, probably even 2015. And, well, yes, definitely 2015, because it's early 2016 that everything's already fallen apart. So most definitely in 2015, they are already setting up with Peter Van Leishout to buy his land. And they still haven't done it. Even though Mark Darwin's got out, doesn't matter because basically all the same players are still there. They've, um, Adrian Brannock has controlled the liquidation side of it. And when it went into auction, the um, actually there were a few stories that came out from people that were actually went to look at buying 3222 at auction. And their comments that came back was that the real estate agent did everything that they could to deter them. And that's kind of unusual. Mostly real estate agents are um, doing everything they can to sell. But it was actually a comment that was said by several people. You know, they said they were putting me off so much or trying to put me off so much. You know, it was like they didn't want to sell it to me. And of course they were because they wanted less bidders at the auction so that it wouldn't push the auction price up too high and that they would be able to phoenix back the community. And uh, I will upload videos actually of where Adrian Brennock took down the sign and says we bought it, well same equivalent, with Bulla Bulla. And then the one where they've done it now it's nightcap on Minjimble, and Adrian Brannock says we bought it back. This man that is a bankrupt, an undischarged bankrupt, that didn't declare his share in Yepi, but moved it into his wife's name, 
did this to maintain his financial interest in this. And he has, through this time, continued to financially profit and benefit from those shares in Yepi and his involvement with this development. But you also might notice too that Tyler Tolman's uh, <laughs> infomercials, when they he introduces the team, Mark Darwin is out of the picture by then. And even though Mark McMurtry has been in there since, well, he was there at Christmas 2015. We know this because Mark Darwin talks about how he and Kiara were there at Christmas time and he lent them money and, you know, now he's been a dick. But it's a conspicuous absence in both Tyler Tolman's uh, infomercials that the only people he focuses on are Cherie Stokes, Richard Moat, Derek Zillman and uh, Philip Dixon and Peter Van Leishout. Adrian Brannock and Mark McMurtry are never mentioned. And I dare say that that's good reason because he probably doesn't like them that much either <laughs> because he doesn't like pot smokers. They would definitely be out. And because they are not the kind of mindset people that he is, definitely, yeah, he wouldn't want to be in a cluster near them. And even though they pretend at being vegans, you can hear in the video, or vegetarians, you can hear in the video that they go out and they sneak burgers. Because they're only pretending to be that for the women in their life, so that they look like, you know, they're doing the right thing. And it's kind of funny to actually think that because here they are, these chauvinistic pigs that, you know, the woman does as she's told. <laughs> and they're all pussy whipped over what they are eating. They have to go and hide to have a meat burger. Ooh, imagine that. Imagine the lack of freedom in your own life to actually hide something as basic as food. Now another thing Tyler Tolman mentions too is that you don't have to pay taxes. You don't have to pay land tax. Well, I don't know what he's talking about, but uh, you do actually have to pay rates and there's no provision that they would be able to get out of paying rates on any of this land. And in doing a calculation for uh, all of their land, the annual rates is in the millions. And that is something that if you're an investor, that you have to consider is an ongoing expense. I know that they would have said that you don't have to pay for that, but when they eventually will cash out and leave you holding everything, uh, yes, you would have to. You would have to come up with millions of dollars each year, hundreds of thousands every three months just to pay your rates. That's not even to keep the lights on in the community centre, to pay for upgrades, the regular seasonal upgrades in the road or anything else that the community has to pay for on a regular basis. That also doesn't include the wages of the people's salaries that Adrian Brannock says they're going to be employing all these people and paying them out of the community. It does not include all the director's salaries that will be coming out of that money as well. That What money? What businesses are actually providing money to Nightcap on Minjimble? There is no income, no valid legal income that I can see anyway. I could see definitely an illegal market in uh, cannabis, pot, selling it off in the area. There was talk even too in the days of Bulla Bulla that there was, what was it, an ice um, cookhouse or whatever they call them, set up on there. So what kind of activities could actually be going on to provide an illegal income is, well, it's open to possibilities because they are most definitely in the area to do it. And 
Dolph Cook up there in his little lot with his, you know, where he comes out and greets people with a gun if he doesn't know you're coming. That's extreme paranoia. What have you got going on there? Clearly, it's not legal and it's not legitimate. Otherwise, why would you feel so threatened to bring out a gun? And what would you do with that gun? You know, would you shoot someone with it? If they were trying to, or if they found what you're trying to hide, or they tried taking what you're trying to hide, would you actually shoot them with it? Because the intent of using a gun, of holding a gun, is the implied threat that you will use it if necessary. If you deem it necessary, you will use a gun. And the level of, it's even in the questionnaire to get into Nightcap on Minjimbo, how you feel about guns. Because if you hear, you know, random bang, bang, bang of a night time, don't, we, we don't want people thinking that it could be some, you know, drunken Mark McMurtry shooting the gun off again because he's having an argument with his missus. We don't want you to think that. We want you to think that it, that there is responsible gun ownership where if you heard shots like that, it would be perhaps because they're shooting wild dogs or something, some other predator uh, that has come into the area or a fox. And they do have problems with foxes and dingoes in this area. And I do know farmers will shoot both of them. And they will also shoot stray dogs as well. So if you haven't got your dog well under control and it doesn't come home, well, maybe it just wandered onto someone's property that they shouldn't have done and it's not coming home. It's, it's gone. Now, I don't know about you, but for me to actually know that people like Mark McMurtry has a gun, Dolph Cook has a gun, these people are not what I'd call stable not mentally all there. That's just my opinion though. I wouldn't know. I'm not a psychiatrist. But it'd be interesting what a psychiatrist might actually come up with as far as diagnosis for both Dolph Cook and Mark McMurtry. And it's interesting that Dolph Cook is actually presenting himself to have to provide medical advice and treatment to all these people palliative care and terminally ill patients that go up there and he gives medical advice and prescribes medical products. Now I'm not sure about anybody else but I'm pretty sure that he's not a doctor. He doesn't have a license, a medical license whatsoever. That that's actually very, very illegal. Now, if you wanted to actually have a look at Dreaded Cheetah's channel, where they did the nightcap on Minjimbal, they also did that uncensored thing. They had people from another Misty Mountains in a different location, where that woman had finally been stricken off from ever giving any medical advice whatsoever. And when I say finally, it was only because it was an ongoing issue that she didn't have the medical qualifications to give the advice that she was giving. And she had far more qualification than what Dolph Cook has in his current condition. Now, my thing too would be is if they are providing care for medical conditions and giving out medical advice, is there also a medical facility there? Is there also a medical doctor? Is there someone with any medical qualifications at all? Or are you just using your industrial hemp license and your, oh, I'm sorry, I don't want to be unkind to Dolph, but I've watched the videos on the Cannabis University and I think that he lost his last working brain cell quite a few decades ago in, in the place where this guy, John, I think his name is, he's talking about things that I know all about, you know, the, the workings of nature and stuff like that. 
And then Dolph will pipe in with something that makes it sound like he's two years old and he's talking to a kindergarten class and he's explaining to them the first time about the basic concepts of growing plants. It's just amazing, you know? And it's like, oh, seriously. Yeah, I do think that there are serious issues with people that have questionable mental states of mind with guns, especially since Mark McMurtry is known to, to use them when he gets drunk, and that's not a very good combination. And I'm sure that the people that came up from Victoria when they got out of the lockdown thought they were coming to a place of freedom and harmony. I mean, that's, that's what they said, isn't it? Do no harm. And where we can come together and be community, you can get away from the matrix and you can have freedom. Well, tell me, you ones that actually came up from Victoria, have you got freedom? Do you actually even know what's going on? I bet you didn't anticipate. Well, they never told you in the ads that the whole community around this development despise them, will not support the... At, uh, the development at all and anyone associated with them you might as well be a leper because nobody wants to know you and you have to feel sorry for the people that have actually come there with that dream in mind to only find that the real community in the area doesn't even want to know them because of why they've come in and it's it's a little bit disappointing others won't care though because they've got dollar signs in their eyes that thinks that this can actually be achieved. But even if, as I explained before, even if they did get approval for stage one roadworks, the chances of them actually ever being able to complete anything past that is 99% assured that it can't happen. The Tweedshire Council are very dedicated. They have been working on this for several years to bring it to the point where, yep, that's it, we've all voted and agreed we will remove rural land sharing communities from the SEPP. We will no longer have to put up with them at all or even consider all the problems that they have been, you know, ongoing for years. Because you can imagine that they have been trying for years to lodge this application with council and the council keeps refusing. And that's why I said they'll never accept it. And it was only when they could lodge it through the portal online that they could actually do that. So when I said the council would never accept it, I was actually correct. They never did. It was accepted online. And I don't think the council's very happy about that sneaky manoeuvre. Along with all the misconceptions that have been presented in the DA. And it'll be interesting to know after Mayor Cherry had said that a amended costings had been requested from the applicant. That whether that will actually be provided. Or you're just going to continue to say, no, it's 37, 000, uh, 37 million. We're just going to ignore that because, you know, we can't answer it because if we answer it, it's going to drop us back to the Tweedshire Council for authority. And we know we're not going to get it off them. Why do you think they padded out the costings? Because they know the Tweedshire Council will not approve this development. Anyway, enough said. I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.